Anyhow, <clears throat> you know what was interesting? If we could discuss for a second, just sure. that the producers always had their names above the titles. You know, Frank Capra. You knew it was a Frank Capra film, but like Schlesinger, uh, Bray, they all took the credit for people that did the work. Otto Mesmer created uh, yeah. Felix the Cat, yeah, right. and the world knows him. Today, people are finally knowing who uh, that Otto Mesmer was the, the genius behind. It took him. a while, yeah. How, does, how did you feel as an animator and everybody else at these studios when the credits were being given to these people who also were in the films? Oh, I hated it. Uh, when I was at Max's, we were doing um, Betty Boop once, and uh, it, was, it was this thing called uh, Betty Boop's Bamboo Isle. And I did a hula hula in there, which is still good animation right now. It's a classic scene. And by God, uh, when the picture came on the screen, of course, we never saw the pictures until they were all done. Uh, God help us, we should have any pencil test, you know. Uh, I didn't get credit. Two other fellows, I think Will Lebowski and somebody else got credit. And I was so angry that I just quit work. And I sat on my desk and I stood uh, Gil Martin, the manager, came, oh, come on, it's only one picture. And I said, I don't give a damn. Uh, I want my name on what I did. You see, they had a system of rotating over at Max's. And uh, so they li had a list of the animators, and maybe about a dozen animators. And uh, as soon as the picture was finished, they picked two of the animators in rotation and stuck their names on the picture. That maybe uh, didn't do a drawing on it, like this bamboo wild thing, with the most insensitive approach to this thing. You know? In fact, they were two quite stupid men, Max and Dave, both. Really? Really. Uh, I, I mean, they didn't understand. Um, I have a letter from Max in which he complained about Walt Disney uh, doing pictures that were too arty. He said that the animated cartoons are cartoony, and the cartoonist should do the picture and not some artist. And Dave was one of the more stupid men in the business. And uh, there was a book that came out that the 10 best directors in the business, and God save us, he was one, you know. He had never directed a picture in his life. Dave he, he was a gag man, yeah. He'd come around every day and say, hey, you got a gig? And God help you if he said no, because he'd give you one, and maybe he had something to do with the subject, and probably not. You know? I mean, you're saying that Dave Fleischer never really directed any of the Superman, or never, was no major impact? Not a thing. A director to me is a man who uh, makes out the exposure sheets, tells the layout man what to do, and uh, gives work to the animators. That's a lay That's a director. Uh, he did none of those. I don't think he could read an exposure sheet if he tried. He had nothing to do with this. But he wanted to be a big wheel, and he figured that the director is the biggest wheel, not really understand a producer is m m more. He should have been called a producer if he wanted to be, but... Uh, and so, what about the, uh, the Kabaga book that came out a while back? Yeah, yeah. The Fleischer story. Yeah. Uh, talked about the fights between Max and Dave. I mean, there must have been some creativity to be around that long. There was no creativity. Max was a creative person Producer when he was doing uh, Coco. As a performer. As a performer and also, uh, you know, doing the actual stories. Uh, but uh, by the time I got to the studio, he had long since quit and he stayed in his office and never came out. I mean, we maybe, he would wander into the studio once in a month, if that. And Dave was there every day, you know, uh, circling around the place, asking, you got a gag? <laughs> and, uh, and coming up with some nonsense, you know. Uh, so I was infuriated that 
he should be listed as one of the eight great directors. It's the biggest stupidity we have in our business, except that some guy wrote a book uh, in which uh, I had helped J.R. Bray to create Colonel Heaselaya uh, when I was three years old. History, just to flash the history books today, mm -hmm. any of them accurate out there? Yeah, Malton, I, I think, is Mice and Magic is Excellent good. Uh, Carbag is a good book. I mean, it's got. I wish she took the book a little further. There's so many things missing that you wanted to know more about. Oh, I, I believe that. But on the other hand, maybe he couldn't get at it either. Yeah. The uh, whole family closed up on that incident, you know. Well, especially yeah. in the, the first part of the book, he's, he makes Max sound so terrible, attacking his brother. And then it kind of just didn't finish the story. He didn't have enough mm. material. Well, I don't know about Max attacking his brother. I, I think that's a, maybe a little one-sided. Uh, Max was a very fatherly person who, like... We're talking about Jewish brothers now, because I'm Jewish. Yeah. I know my father and his brother, the hate-love relationship. Oh, sure. Well, yeah. no, I think Max and Dave had that. But uh, it never it never came out in public ever, at least as far as I know. Uh, but Max was a very kindly person. I, I remember when I got uh, salary a hundred dollars a week. Uh, there was a fortune in in those days, you know. That was nineteen hundred thirty. A hundred dollars a week was so much money, you almost didn't know what to do with it, except I began to get a whole group of relatives who were starving to death, and 10 here and 25 there, and pretty soon I was broke. And so I remember one day I went into Max and I asked him, uh, could I have my salary in advance? And he blew a gasket. He said, you should be saving money at this time and uh, getting rich in time, um, the idea that you're broke with all this money, I don't understand it. It bawled me out for 20 minutes. But he finally gave me the money. Um, so I can't quite measure up this very kindly man with, uh, uh, you know, less uh, making him such a villain. He might have been, I don't know. Can we, talk, can we talk about for a second while we're at yeah. the Fleischer Studios? Max is given credit for being a uh, a, des uh, like a genius in regards to designing advances in animation. One of them was the rotoscope. Yeah, mm. he really should have been an inventor. He was always inventing many things are absolutely useless. Like he designed a horizontal camera, which is crazy. It's a big long thing like this. And as I watched uh, somebody try to operate it, uh, he pulled back the glass which holds the drawings on, and of course they fell off the pegs. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Who would think of doing something so useless? Also, when I was working down in Miami, they must have had six cameras. None of them could perform like a good Oxbury. They all stopped short. One of them, uh, could only shoot things on a six field. Another went to an 11 field, but not uh, not anything else. And uh, they were a series of uh, wrecks you know, called inventions. And uh, in fact, uh, when I first came down to Miami, this is the second time I worked for them in, in 1939. I, I worked on Gulliver, at the very end of Gulliver. Went in the camera room, and I watched them, uh, the camera, excuse me, operator was, was waiting while the camera went click, zoom, click, zoom, and, and it took three exposures for every drawing, you know. So uh, it was a man named Charlie Shetler. So I said, Charlie, what the hell are they taking all this time for? We don't use that kind of exposure on the coast. It's too slow. He said, why do you mind your own business? You know, we're doing very well here, and you come in, you think you're so smart? And I said, well, yeah, I think I'm smart. I don't understand why you're doing this. 
He said, why don't you get the hell out of here? <laughs> so I did. You were younger but, than everybody else there too, right? Pretty much? No, no, not really, no. Mm -mm. I would say uh, uh, most of us, when I first went to Max's was uh, 1930, and uh, so I was about 20, 21, I guess, something like that. And I would think most of the boys were 21 to 23, no more than that. Yeah. And Max, and how old was Max? 14? Max already had gray hair, you know, so he was probably in his 40s. So he looks at all the animators, also his kids, and do oh, what yeah. I tell you because I'm the daddy. He said my kids all the time, his kids. Uh, you know, Willie Henning was not, not a kid, he was an animator, he was, he was 40, so he was not a kid, but that's a Victorian thing. He was a Victorian gentleman, you know, and when they had that strike, I could not believe that it was Max who hired the goons to protect the workers who stayed in. It's not, it's not his nature, I think Paramount. Yeah, well Paramount was already yeah. had hired people to protect their studio there. Yeah, I, I think it's Paramount. But wasn't it the best thing that happened for the animators because the producers were still, you know, would take advantage of you and not pay you well enough. They weren't making money from this. Oh, of course. Well, it wasn't that they weren't paying us enough because the animators were kind of a rare obvious at that time. They, uh, you could call, pick up a phone and call any studio in the business and say, I'm thinking of uh, leaving here and get an offer of a job like immediately, yeah. What was the loyalty to stay at Fleischer? Uh, what loyalty? Uh, the, uh, the loyalty that I had was to my profession. But by the time I got involved in sound uh, and became a director, I was a director. There. They called them head animators, and they was the director. But we were directors. Uh, I got so interested in the problem of being a director, I dropped my violin, uh, I stopped doing any painting, and I really got into this in this business. Uh, up to then, I always thought it was a transitory thing. In regards to, uh, just for my audience to know also, is when uh, Windsor McKay made his drawings, he had one assistant. He did just the back. He traced the backgrounds over and over ad infinitum. That's his only job, and the only uh, only reason that he was allowed on there it wasn't a creative job. It was just a nuisance that had to be done. Each each great drawing had to have its background. It wasn't until much later that there was this, this little man named Earl Hurd. Um, conceived the idea of using uh, acetate uh, on the drawings and having one background for the whole shot. Did he ever copyright that process? He and uh, Bray, well, I, I guess he went to Bray for money or something. So it was called the Bray Hurd process, but it was really Hurd. And they uh, had a copyright. In fact, Harrison and Gould at Crazy Cat had the gall to go around to the staff of 12 or 13 people uh, to try to get us to contribute money to a lawsuit to stop uh, Ray Hurd from uh, having a copyright. I think that's husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to my audience about Rotis 